Hi and welcome to episode 3 of my series on quantum field theory. Whereas the last two episodes were very math heavy, in this episode I will give you some intuition about what the propagator and especially the source function in quantum field theory actually represent. While I love solving integrals and math puzzles myself, I also believe that writing out all the steps does not really help in expanding your understanding of the physics itself that much. So in this episode I decided to write out the solutions of the integrals in a document, which I have linked in the description below. If you are interested in working out the integrals yourself, please have a look there. Otherwise I will simply show you the result in this video, so we can actually focus on the intuition rather than the mathematical steps. Now without further ado, let us start with the expression of the propagator in 4 dimensional spacetime we derived in the previous episode and explore a little further from there on. Here we have the expression of the propagator in 4 dimensional spacetime. X and Y here are two events in spacetime, each written as a 4 factor where X0 and Y0 denote the time dimension and Xi and Yi denote the spatial dimensions. Xi are just distances in units of length, so to make the whole 4 factor have units of length, we say that x0 must have units of length as well. We can also accomplish this by writing x0 as the speed of light c times time t. Because the speed of light has units length over time, it perfectly cancels the dimension of time again and we get the desired dimension of length in our 4 factor. Now, I wrote a dot product in the exponential inside the propagator without really defining this dot product at all. Since we are working in space-time, where space and time are treated on opposite footing, we need to write the dot product between two four factors in the following way. We do this to ensure the dot product in space-time is Lorentz invariant, and I use the so-called mostly negative metric convention, which as the name suggests is just a convention. Where I wrote k squared I then also mean k dot k, which is written like this. In order for the exponential to be unitless, we need the k4 factor to have units of inverse length, so it is similar to the angular wave number in a normal wave equation, and it is related to the momentum of the field. The term i times eta in the denominator is added to make sure we obtain physical results instead of quantum fields that oscillate infinitely fast, but it will get a physical meaning in this video as well later on. Let us finally not forget the relation between the propagator and the field function itself. We started with the field function as the sum of all propagators multiplied by the sources jk. We then moved to a continuous theory by saying that jk equals delta times j of y. In four dimensions we do the same, writing jk as delta to the fourth times j of y, and we add a factor of i just as a convention. Now our field function writes as the following, we replace the sum with an integral and there you have it. We obtain the expression of the field value in 4 dimensional spacetime as an integral over all propagators capital pi of x minus y multiplied by the source function j of y. We can fill in our expression for the propagator to get the field function as the following integral from which we can derive our first very nice result. Something very profound happens to our integral when we multiply the field function from the left with the second derivative with respect to x and then add a term m squared. I worked out the derivation in section 1 of my document and to make a short story even shorter, the integral on the right hand side simply solves to give the source function and location x. By acting on our field function with this operator, we obtain the Klein-Gordon equation for a scalar field phi. This is a very powerful result that enables us to find solutions for the field function for different sources j of x. For example, when the source function j is zero everywhere, we find that the field function results in simple wave equations, as I have derived for you in section 2 of my document. To see how more interesting sources affect the field function phi, let us have a look at three examples. In our first example, we set our source equal to a delta function of the spatial coordinates x. This means we have a source that is located at the origin, at x equals zero, but it lasts for all times t since it has no t dependence. Given our field function as a function of this source term, I worked out the integral in section 3 of my document, and the result is the following. 
The obtained field function is radially symmetric and decays exponentially with increasing distance from the origin, and it gives exactly the so-called Yukawa potential. Since there is no time dependence in this field, it is not very interesting yet, but it will become more interesting once we add interaction terms in our action later on. Another example of a source would be to set j of x equal to the delta function x0. You could interpret this as particles being created at all locations in space, but only when the time is exactly zero. It's like the field suddenly makes one huge jump and then settles down again. The solution of entering this source into our field function is worked out in section 4 in the document, and it results in the following equation. Here eta is the eta that appeared in our propagator, and you can see that again we get a solution with some exponential decay, only now it is a decay with respect to time. As you can see we get a field function that is proportional to the exponent of minus eta times ct over m. This is reminiscent of a particle with a half-life tau written like this. We thus found our interpretation of little eta. It determines the half-life of a particle in our field. The fact that we excited the field across all of space does not matter for us. You could see this as creating an infinite number of particles, each with a half-life tau, such that after waiting for tau seconds, only half of the created particles remain, and so on. Our last example is the following very specific formula for a source term. You could read this as a source that is active for some time sigma zero around t equals zero, and in the region of volume sigma cubed around the spatial origin. The terms including the momenta p0 and vector p are added for reasons that become clear when you study the Fourier transform of this source. I worked this out for you in section 5 of my document, and it is written like this. Notice that from this form you can deduce that the momenta k of the particles produced by the source are centered around p0 and vector p, so while the source is located in physical space for some short amount of time, through another lens it can be seen as producing particles around momentum p. Unfortunately, we cannot easily solve the field function of this complex source, but we can derive some useful results from it if we study the math together. I will show you this dauntingly looking formula just for a short moment, but have a look with me at what we can learn from this expression. Notice how in the exponential we have two terms that describe oscillatory behavior, but there is also an exponentially decaying term which I will mark in red here. This exponential decay becomes larger the more the wave factor k of the field drifts away from the three momentum p over h bar. Therefore, we only expect to find fruitful resonant behavior the more comparable these two variables are. The same is true for the p0 term in the denominator. The bigger this difference, the smaller the contribution of this momentum to the total field value. From these two conditions, for factor k and k0, we find that the momenta that contribute most to our field value are those that satisfy the following relation. This is exactly the mass shell condition in special relativity. Particles with momenta that satisfy this condition are called on-shell, and particles that don't satisfy this condition are called off-shell, or virtual particles. Note that there is nothing magical about being on or off-shell. The only difference is that the on-shell particles have the possibility of traveling over infinite distances, while the effect of off-shell particles on its surroundings quickly vanishes over larger distances and times. It's simply a matter of constructive and destructive interference that differentiates the two. And that's all for this episode. I hope this video gave you some clearer ideas about the source function, on and off shell particles and the propagator in general. In the next episode we will have a look at the very useful mathematical toolbox of Feynman diagrams. But for now thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.